Hey Pottery people, welcome back to Pottery Plus. It's so great to see you. It's just you and me here today. Miss Daniela is out for the day, but she will rejoin us in two weeks. Dee, we miss you and we'll see you there. Um, today I thought we would talk a little bit about uh, how you can prepare yourself for your very first day of your very first pottery class. It can be really intimidating walking into a pottery studio for the first time when you've never been in one before. And I mean, I remember my first day of pottery class in college. It, it was really intimidating. And so um, I just thought it might be a good topic to cover today for those of you who might just be getting back out there and, and doing in-person activities again and maybe getting ready to do your first class and wondering kind of what to expect. And just quickly, I wanted to um, just share with you a little bit about my background with beginners. Um, when I graduated from college, I got super lucky and I got this wonderful internship at a local arts center. And I just kind of kept, kept working there and I ended up teaching there for 10 years. And um, I taught all different levels. You know, I had taught um, intermediate and advanced and, and even like some open studio classes where uh, it was really independently driven by the students. But I always liked beginners the best because that is where I would see the most growth and the most excitement. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about the beginner experience and um, how to make it uh, the best beginner experience for people. And so I kind of thought a video like this might sort of add on to, you know, be a continuation of what I used to do in class is to um, provide some information outside of class before you even get there that might make the experience a little bit better um, and, and feel a little bit more comfortable for you. So I kind of broke it down into three categories. And the first category is physical stuff. So one thing is you're gonna need to wear closed toed shoes. And I know, I know, I know, I wear these and I might be already busted for wearing these because I'm pretty sure I've posted these on social media or I'm sure they've been in some videos, some of my videos. But um, I work in a home studio. My studio is in my home. And so it's just a much softer environment uh, that is free of the variable of what other people are doing. So when you're in a commercial studio with big equipment and, and other people around you, it's going to be important to protect your feet. That's the first thing. The second thing is you're going to want to go in with short nails. And I know, like, I know some of us want to wear long nails and do pottery. But the thing is, is you really won't be able to throw at all with, with long nails. And with hand building, you can kind of get away with it better. But I find like when I let my nails grow a little bit too long, I just nick the surface of everything with my nails. And I mean, mine never get that long. It, it only takes a little bit for that to start happening. Now that's not the end of the world, but um, I would say if it's a throwing class, keep them short for the first class. And then if you, if you want some accommodation, maybe talk to your instructor about it. Um, but I am a big proponent of using instructional time that you're paying for efficiently. So there were a couple times when I was teaching where someone would show up with long nails and they would just say, well, I guess I just can't do the activity today. And I just, I really didn't like when that happened because I felt like they weren't getting the most of what they had signed up for and paid for. So again, keep them short the first time and then maybe see if you can work on figuring something out if you really want to wear your long nails um, outside of pottery. Uh, the third and last thing to, to keep in mind to prepare yourself physically for your first pottery class is dress for your comfort level of messiness. <laughs> and what I mean by that is if you're on the wheel, you're probably definitely going to get pretty messy. If you're hand building, you will probably just get like dusty because there's just pottery studios are just dusty places. Um, but that doesn't mean you need to dress in a particular way. It just means that whatever clothes you're comfortable getting dirty in, that's what you should wear. And so like I had some students over the years who were like, I'm not going to sacrifice my personal style <laughs> for my pottery class. I'll just, I'm going to wear what I want to wear. And if it gets dirty on the wheel, I'll go home and wash it. And I, and I kind of loved that. Like I always respected that. So um, I'm not saying dress any particular way, just wear clothes that you're comfortable getting messy in and whatever that means to you, that's what, that's what you wear. Next, moving on to like studio operational stuff. Um, if your uh, instructor gives you a tour, 
I would say pay close attention on that tour and maybe even make some notes. Um, I always got the vibe from my students and like this was okay, but I always got the vibe from my students when I would do the tour that it was like kind of a throwaway activity or like an icebreaker. And we would usually go back and revisit the information from the tour because, you know, it's your first few minutes in the studio. It, it's, it can be kind of overwhelming and not the, not the most conducive time to absorb every bit of information that's being thrown at you. But the studio tour is important because pottery moves through a studio in a very particular way. And so you're going to need to know where your pottery is physically at different points along the process so that you can um, basically find it. <laughs> so know those stations of where you find your, your work when it's in um, a particular state. And that is going to give you a big advantage moving forward because you're not going to have to waste time looking around uh, and trying to find things because you don't know where they are. Okay, that's one thing. Next is keep an eye out for the details of the process that might not be working. And what I mean by that is I have an example that I that I like to share with people. It's the bat story. So quickly, let me just explain what is a bat. So a bat is a piece kind of looks like a plate that fits over. Now this is just if you're throwing, but it fits over the wheel head. And what it's there for is, well, they, they serve a few different purposes, but the main one is after you throw a pot, instead of it being stuck to the wheel, you can just lift this up, move it to the side, grab a new bat, and you're ready to roll for your next piece of pottery. And you haven't mangled your pot because you know when you pick up a completely saturated piece it I mean it basically ruins it so and friends if you go to your first class and your bats don't look like this or they're not using bats at all sometimes some programs um, there are some little tools that will help you remove a pot from the wheel head without having to touch it but more commonly you are gonna find that your program has bats um, but some are plastic there's like black plastic ones there's wooden ones there's larger and smaller ones so they don't all look just like this but you will likely be working with bats so here's the story on that so uh, several years ago I had gone up to the art center when I was still working there and um, it was during another instructor's class and I think she was teaching like an intermediate class, but a beginner had gotten in there anyway. And um, so I was kind of trying to just remain a fly on the wall and get in and out. But <clears throat> I started talking to one of her students or he started talking to me and we were looking at his pots and they were messed up. And I was like, why are your pots like this? And we, we figured out that he hadn't been using bats. He had been throwing his his clay right on the wheel head and then and then taking the pieces with his hands and moving them. And this was his second class. So he's three to four hours into instructional time and he had been doing it wrong and nobody caught it. And, um, you know, we got it corrected and he thought that he had to buy his own bats, but we had like dozens and dozens of student bats. So the reason why I share all of that long story short information is if you feel that something's not working, uh, ask about it. Don't just kind of keep pushing forward because you feel embarrassed to ask or whatever. Because like, I just looked at that situation and I found it so upsetting because first of all, no one had paid enough attention to this student to help him correct that. And second of all, like I said, he had paid for several hours of time where he, he was not learning the way that he should have just because of a little detail, like, like a tool, like a bat. So um, when I would start like the first couple of weeks with new students, someone would almost always sit down uh, without a bat and they would go, Kara, this feels weird. What, what am I doing wrong? And it would just be that they needed to go get a bat. So alert your instructor to those things. If something is feeling off, don't be afraid to ask. Um, we want you to ask us questions. That's what we're there for. So um, just pay attention to those little details and, and, and trust yourself if something feels weird and, and ask, just ask. Because um, again, we really want to, to make your experience good. Uh, so that's that's what we're that's what we're here for. Use your instructor to your advantage. And then the very last thing that that I wanted to share with like studio operations is kind of a silly thing. It's kind of obvious, but clean up after yourself really well. <laughs> and I don't know if I should say this. I feel like this is a little bit like I don't know. I sound like I'm gossiping or something, but. The truth is this, I love my fellow potters, 
But there's kind of always that person in a group studio situation that's like overly eager to find someone who didn't clean up as thoroughly as, as they thought they should have and will, you know, wants to write that note on the whiteboard that's like, your mother doesn't work here. Clean up after yourselves. <laughs> So you don't want to get on that person's radar. So clean your tools, your equipment, and your space like more thoroughly than it seems like you need to, and you'll be better off, okay? All right, so moving on. The next little bit that I wanted to talk about here, and this is just a couple more things that I'm going to share. They're kind of miscellaneous, but there are things that I found myself saying to adults, or sorry, not adults, well, yes, adults, but beginner students like all the time. And so I just thought I would throw these two in at the end because maybe they, I think they're, they might be valuable just like as a rule of thumb for beginners. So the first thing here is, um, so it's helpful to deepen your knowledge of the pottery process to understand that different clays, glazes, and kilns all go to different temperatures. So there's this huge temperature range and you have to match your clay to your glaze to your firing process. To get your pottery to work out in the end and basically do what's called vitrification, which means to transform into glass, but pottery is not fully glass, obviously, but there's some glass in it. Anyway, it goes down a long rabbit hole, but our, our goal with our materials is that vitrification, which basically just means it's done. It's to its strongest um, uh, end point. And a good visual of this, friends, is like to look at the pyrometric cone chart because it gives you an idea and it shows uh, what temperatures different clays and glazes go to to get to that vitrification point. And this is not something you will be quizzed on. You are not gonna have to pick the right materials that work together. Uh, you know, you're not gonna have to like know about this in depth. But again, it just gives a deeper knowledge of understanding of how the whole process of making pottery works. And I bring it up because I had so many students that would go really far in their journey. Like they would be very knowledgeable, but they would just have like no idea that you can't just throw any clay in any glaze in any kiln. Like those things have to be intentionally put together uh, to get a successful result, okay? So that's just kind of like a conceptual thing, but that's also pretty technical and pretty boring. So if you wanna skip that part of the video, <laughs> more power to you. That, maybe that's my own thing that I just like to geek out on. But um, I just, yeah, that would go over people's heads a lot of times. And so I just kind of thought uh, that that's a good thing just for general understanding. And then the last thing that I wanted to share with you is that I used to, this is kind of funny because it's ironic, but I used to always tell my students, please do not watch YouTube videos. And I know it's funny because I make them now, but the feedback that I would get from them about what they had seen on YouTube is kind of like what inspired me. And so I would hear a lot of doubt and a lot of questioning about their progress and the techniques that they were practicing because they had watched videos that weren't appropriate for them to be using as an educational tool. Uh, watch whatever you want for entertainment purposes. But if you're going to use videos as um, a way to kind of enhance your learning experience, look for a few things, okay? Really good narration. So find videos where they're explaining to you thoroughly what they're doing and how they're doing it. Try to stay away from time lapse because again, you can't get very much information when it's going so fast. And also um, pick videos that are appropriate to your level. If you're watching a very high level uh, professional potter just kind of show off and do all the cool things, like I love those videos and I love when people make it look easy and it's just like, it's so satisfying to watch. But for educational purposes, maybe save those videos for later, okay? Because again, you wanna, you wanna enjoy where you're at and feel confident in where you're at when you're learning to throw. Um, things that, that knock you off your confidence slow you down. And again, you, you, you kind of spin your wheels and, and spend time um, wondering about and doubting, you know, the, the part of the process that you're in. And nine times out of 10, friends, your instructor is going to have your techniques tailored to beginners and maybe even tailored to you. I would watch my students for a couple weeks and then I would even even kind of 
um, hone in a little bit more and try to figure out what would be good for that particular student. So, and I, you know, I think most of us on the instructor side, we, we want to do that too. We want to make your experience as good as it can possibly be. So that's going to wrap it up. I hope some of this was helpful for you. And if you are beginning or you're getting ready to go to your first uh, beginner's class, let us know. Give us feedback. If there's any more questions that you have, let me know. I love interacting with beginners. So thank you for joining us. And um, we'll see you in two weeks. But in the meantime, if you have feedback, you can leave it in the comments. Find us on Facebook at Pottery Plus or Instagram at Pottery Plus Co. Thanks again, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.